Cool. Um, I'm, so, I'm so glad to get a chance to speak to you today. Um, we're going to be talking about generosity, as you can see on the screen. Oh no, the money chat, dun dun dun, you think, but not quite this time. Um, although I do have some good news on that front. Um, today we're going to be thinking about um, generosity as a godly character trait. Um, every year as part of our Autumn Feast deal, we practice intentional generosity, and I'll be talking a little bit about why we have that practice, um, but also we'll be thinking about how we can show generosity more widely. It's going to be fun. It's going to be a fun money chat, and how often do you get to say that? Uh, but before we get into it, let me bless you real quick, and then you'll know what to do. I bless you in the name of Jesus to know Jesus even more wonderfully today. May God bless you and protect you. May he smile upon you and be gracious to you. May he show you his favor and give you his peace. In the name of Jesus, may it be more like it. Good times, my dudes, good times. And they are good times. Um, around here, we love to do Jesus-y things, and one of those Jesus-y things is celebrating. We love to celebrate the things that Jesus celebrated. And I'm not sure if celebrate is quite uh, the right word here, but on Friday from 6 p.m. through until yesterday at 6 p.m., we remembered the Day of Atonement. And the Day of Atonement is the most solemn day in the Jewish calendar, and Jewish people view it like Judgment Day. Um, it was the day when, during the sacrificial time, the high priest needed to make preparations for himself so that he was ready to enter the most holy place and only then was he allowed to go in and intercede for the people. And I hope this isn't too much of an oversimplification for you, but when people are around, things get messy. Um, so the high priest had to like bathe and put on ceremonial clothes he had to sacrifice a bull to purify himself and his own family. He had to sacrifice one goat as a sin offering for the people and use the blood of the bull and the goat to cleanse the tabernacle or the temple, depending on the period of history. And then he had to confess the sins of the entire nation over another goat, and then it was driven out into the wilderness. Look, God always takes his laws and his commands seriously, but for the Day of Atonement, it feels like he takes it up a notch. And he gives like fair warning about this and how it's to be taken extra ser seriously. He's chatting, when the high priest enters the sanctuary area, he must follow these instructions fully. And if the high priest follows these instructions, he will not die. Like these things are to be taken really seriously since, to be fair, we're talking about the collective sins of an entire nation during the whole period of a calendar year. That's not nothing. <laughs> And when people are around, things get messy. And when people are around, and there's a lot of them, and there's a lot of a year, things get pretty messy. And um, God puts it like this. He says, the high priest will lay both his hands on the goat's head and confess over it all the wickedness, rebellion, and sins of the people of Israel. And in this way, he will transfer the people's sins to the head of the goat. God's talking rebellion. He's talking wickedness. He's talking the sins of the entire people. Like, this is heavy. This is serious stuff. It's a serious day. And dudes knew when it would be coming up. And they knew what they had been up to. And since there's a collective part of this that's really important for the Day of Atonement, they're going to be aware of at least some of the stuff that other people had been up to, and they're gonna know that there's a lot at stake here. And they're gonna be going into the Day of Atonement um, just hoping that God would show grace and mercy. They're just hoping that God would grant them one more year. It's a serious business. Now, we don't need to do um, too much of a deep dive into 
uh, into it to see how Jesus' sacrifice on the cross fulfills the Day of Atonement. You know, Jesus, um, part of what he did is like he acted like both goats. Like the first goat, he was the sacrifice for us. And a key difference there that makes Jesus better is that he willingly chose to do it. Um, he's, he's like the first goat, but he's better. And he's like the second goat in that he absorbed into himself all of the sins, not just the sins of one people for one year, but all of the sins of all the people for every year. And because Jesus' victory is better, this doesn't need to be a year-on-year -year thing anymore. Jesus' victory is comprehensive. It's one and done. That's so good. And another key difference is that although Jesus experienced separation from God on the cross, that was experienced temporarily. Jesus is similar but just way better. And what Jesus has done and the victory that he has accomplished means that we don't need to have the same dread over our sins. I mean, our sins are equally as serious as anybody else's sins and they need forgiven for real. But we don't approach like Easter or the Day of Atonement thinking, oh, I just hope, I hope, hope, I hope, hope, hope that God will forgive me. I hope that I'll be granted another year. That's not the way it works for us. We can have confidence and security in our salvation. It just wasn't the experience of Jewish people during the sacrificial times. So they made a plan. Because you don't want God to look at all your thoughts and attitudes and actions over the course of a year and only see bad stuff. Like no point in going into the Day of Atonement with your own personal stock so low. So why not just do um, a couple of good things to maybe top that up a little bit, approaching the Day of Atonement? Um, it made sense to Jewish people that as the Day of Atonement approached, for them to show, to demonstrate that they take doing good and they take being good seriously. And a common way to do this was by making extra effort as the Day of Atonement approached, extra effort to show generosity. And you can either look at this cynically, like they were trying to butter God up so that he might think, ah, sure, it's not so bad. Um, like someone could have the most wicked, rebellious, sinful year and then do a couple of wee generosity things as the Day of Atonement approaches and that'll make up for it or that'll make all the bad things go away. Like that's not how it works and it's not a wonderful motivation for generosity. Or we can look at this a different way. We can see that part of receiving forgiveness, part of seeking forgiveness, part of being sorry is showing that you are sorry. And part of repenting from selfish acts, like that's what sin is, is acting selflessly. And a great way to act selflessly is by showing generosity to others. So getting some last minute generous acts in is more of a precursor to what was to come should God grant them another year? And that's much better motivation. And the thing that I really like about this is that it shows that generosity requires intentionality. And let me give you a little example of this from one of the most generous people that I have ever met, and that is Jamie's dad. Um, Jim Halliday um, values financial stability and preparedness. He doesn't spend money flippantly. He spends it on the things that matter to him. And he worked hard his whole life um, to provide something better for Jamie and for her brother Sam than he grew up with himself. Um, Jim and Jamie's mum, Leslie, like Jim and Leslie worked five jobs between them when they were getting married so that they could get out of Belfast in the 1970s so that they could have a better life for them now and provide something better um, for kids that were going to come in the future. And last weekend, we were back staying with them, and they have this, like, little, like, TK Maxx kind of, like, home decor sign in their living room that somebody bought for them when they retired, and it reads, retired and happy spending our kids' inheritance. This is their exact sign. It's cute. It's just like one of those little cute parent things, isn't it? Um, love it. It is cute. It's not accurate. It's not accurate. Obviously, this would be better. There we go. Apostrophes count. But that's not what I'm talking about. Um, this sign is not accurate because they are retired and they are happy, but... Jim still saves a portion of his pension every month. 
Even though his financial deal has changed, the way he responds to money hasn't changed. He's still making sure that he is ready for whatever life throws at him, and he's making sure that he is ready to be generous. And Jim has helped us, and Leslie, I'm going to give Leslie some credit too, um, they have helped us with some like big things in life. Like they helped Jamie out when, with a deposit for when she was buying her first house. And then when we got married, I moved into that house and I'm thankful. Um, he, <laughs> doesn't hurt. Um, he, they also helped us out when we were putting a new kitchen into our flat. Like big things, you know, big things that take like years of planning and saving. But there's also those like smaller everyday sort of things that Jim does to show generosity. For example, he may well be the single most difficult person to buy a pint for that you could ever meet in your life. You think you're going to buy him a pint, but just when the card reader comes out, beep, there he is. And you think you're going to do it, but he's there. In the big ways and the little ways, he is so generous, so generous. My point is that when you steward things well, you're ready to be generous. And that might be those big things that take a lot of planning, even years of planning, or it might be those smaller but significant and they're high frequency things. Those are good too. When we're not intentional about it, then we're not prepared to be generous and that makes things way harder for us. And to be fair, none of us, think, none of us need things to be harder because already this generosity thing can be plenty hard for humans. And today we're going to look really quickly at two really similar events from the Gospel of Luke, and we're going to spot some of what I am going to call generosity mindset traps, so catchy, um, to avoid, uh, that we want to avoid those ones, and we want to see what goodness we can learn from Jesus. So here's that first um, set of events that come in Luke chapter 10, um, that start one day. An expert in religious law stood up to test Jesus by asking him this question. Teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus replied, well, what's the law? Moses says, how do you read it? And the man answered, you must love the Lord your God. Oh, hi. Thanks, Jimmy. Um, sorry, podcast people. Um, Jesus answered, the man answered, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart all your soul, all your strength, and all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Right. Jesus told him, do this and you'll live. But the man wanted to justify his actions, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And Jesus replied with a story. Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho and he was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him up and left him half dead beside the road. By chance, a priest came along. But when he saw the man lying there, he crossed over to the other side of the road and passed him by. A temple assistant walked over and looked at him lying there, but he also passed by on the other side. Then... A despised Samaritan came along, and when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. Going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them. He put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn where he took care of him. And the next day, he handed the innkeeper two silver coins, telling him, take care of this man. If his bill runs higher than this, I'll pay you the next time I'm here. Now, which of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by bandits? Jesus asked. The man replied, well, the one who showed mercy. And Jesus said, yeah. Now go do the same. So set in the scene, um, Jesus has been asked what it takes to inherit eternal life. Yo, Luke is a really good book, um, for real. Like, I love how Luke takes care to, re to record loads of detail. And recording let like, the expert of the law used the word inherit gives us those vibes of, like, I want to get something. Like, I want to get something more. And the first part of the answer that a dude gives to his own question, like that love God with all you've got thing, he has no problems with that. Like I'm sure by his own estimations, he's crushing that. The second part though, loving your neighbor, 
different vibes. Um, Luke doesn't necessarily address uh, this issue here, but in like the next like 10 chapters, Luke records like all of Jesus' teaching where he either indirectly or like mad directly hits the religious elite with just how terrible they are at this thing. And we don't have time for that now. Um, so like chapter 11, 12 through 17, blah, 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 blah. We'll just look at Jesus' immediate answer to who is the neighbor in this parable. Most of the time when we talk about this story, the priest and the temple assistant are kind of just part of the setup. And we think that our learning really kicks in when the Samaritan comes onto the scene. Like he's the one we want to learn from. We see his care, uh, his generosity with his care and his resources, his time and his money. And uh, we think that he's the one we want to learn from. But when we do that, we miss a thing because although we learn from positive example, we can also learn from negative examples. And the first mindset trap that can seriously hinder our generosity is very visible in this parable. And that's that we sometimes just end up with a mindset of like, I'm a let someone else take care of that. Do you know? The priest and the temple assistant, both good, clean living dudes, and they just walk on by. They make caring for someone else, someone else's problem. And digging into this, like they probably had good reasons for why they did that, you know, like maybe um, they thought the man was dead and if they touch a corpse, that's gonna make them unclean and they wouldn't be able to do their job. Maybe that was their reason. And whatever our reasons, we can end up sometimes making generosity out to be something that maybe like someone else is more suited for than us, do you know? And like we always have a reason. No one stoats around trying to not be generous. And whether those reasons for not being generous are legit or not, well, that'll be pretty circumstantial, won't it? Do you know? Like sometimes they might be, sometimes not. But we always have a reason. And that's another question for another day. The point that Jesus is making is that we have got a responsibility when it comes to being generous. And the story demonstrates while it's not it in its entirety, but generosity is an important part of loving people. So we'll heed the warning that neglecting generosity is neglecting our responsibility to follow Jesus' command to love our neighbors. And for sure, we want to be more like the despised Samaritan than the priest or the temple assistant. Now, the juicy part of this story, like the classic thing that gets brought out from this story, is that the generosity comes from a less than likely source. And for real, that's a spicy bit, considering the story is being told to a Jewish audience, to a Jewish religious leader, no less. But Jesus is calling out another mindset trap here that we can find ourselves having. And that's just like being like generosity neutral. And by this, I mean categorizing people into the generous ones and then like everybody else. And I'm not saying that there's generous ones and there's not generous ones because nobody really thinks about themselves as a not generous one. Like nobody's walking around being like, I'm not generous. I'm trying to not be generous. Because if they did, they would recognize that that's like a pretty bad character trait and they probably want to do something about it. But if we don't recognize ourselves as generous, then we're not going to be stepping into that. We're not going to be living in that. We're not going to be acting generously. When we think of ourselves as like there's generous people and there's just everybody else, we kind of end up being generosity neutral and we don't do anything. If we were considering ourselves to be generous, then we would live in our generosity. If we were considering ourselves to not be generous, then we would do something about it and move towards generosity, and at least that's something. But being generosity neutral, kind of linked a bit to making it someone else's problem, just kind of is like ending up with the same inaction and nothing happens that comes with that first mindset trap. Otherwise, we'll just be like, I'm not uh, generosity, that's for somebody else, that's for Jim Halliday, and you're just going to get on with the rest of your day. But in reality, we all have high generosity potential. And activating that potential comes from having a mindset that is ready to take the responsibility to do what you can to be generous to the people that God sets in front of you. And maybe for like the Samaritan dude in the story that's caring for someone in need, or maybe that's just using whatever finances you have to bless someone with kindness, no matter what their financial position is. 
um, a pretty good indicator of where you might land with the whole generosity neutral thing is um, how easy you find it to receive generosity. Like you can tell if you value generosity if you're able to receive it. And um, I realized that I was really terrible at this when we moved to America. Um, Americans are many things. And being generous as just like a cultural baseline is one of those things. Like one of the most generous cultures I think you're gonna find. For example, here are the rules of coffee in America that um, it should be black, it should be eight ounces, it should be $2 and you should never buy one of them. You should always buy one for somebody else. And when we moved to America, um, after a while I realized that dudes were either trying to buy me coffee, actually buying me my coffee, but that I was never offering to buy them their coffee. Because when we go for a coffee with a pal, it's, it's kind of just like normal, generally speaking, that we buy our own, right? Like it's normal for us, it's not rude, it's just like our version of polite to say, oh, no, 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 don't worry about it, it's fine, no, I can get myself, don't worry, no, 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 it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. Or maybe that's just Northern Ireland. That's the way we do it. That's kind of our version of polite. It's not their version of polite. And when I did that in America, where it's not the cultural standard, I realized that I was just by like misplaced politeness, like saying no to somebody's generosity. And that was a bummer for them. And I quickly realized that a better response to saying like, no, 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 don't worry about it, is like, oh, thanks mate, next time on me. And then actually doing that, do you know? And just as a wee, like not in the text thing, but since we're on the subject, a third mindset trap is just like, kind of like fair's fair, right? Do you know, you buy yours and I'll buy mine and fair's fair. And in some circumstances that's necessary and it's fine. I'm not saying um, you have to buy everybody everything. Um, I'm just saying that sometimes, in some circumstances, being nice is more important <laughs> than being fair. And I'm wondering what, people in America thought of me when they weren't worrying about being fair. They're like, I've bought this dude like plenty of coffees and he's not even, not even offered once, but they still kept offering. That's generosity. And I'm over here like unintentionally being mean. Whew, I was a bad person. And I was kind of shocked at, um, once I realized this, how little being generous in this kind of way even crossed my mind. And like, me falling into that mindset trap stifled their generosity. They tried to be generosity and I, generous and I wouldn't let them, so then I would never reciprocate. And then, if you do receive someone's generosity, then you do think, oh, that was a kind thing. I want to, I want to be kind back. It's not like a quid pro quo thing, but it's like I want to be kind back. So although it's true that like ungenerosity means more ungenerosity. It's definitely true that generosity catalyzes more generosity. Do you know, let a dude buy you a coffee. Buy a dude a coffee. I mean, it's only $2. Crooksy. Um, it's 2024 and coffee isn't $2. Um, if coffee costs two of anything, it's more like two days wages these days. I get it. Um, I'm aware that in our current climate, um, we do need to be more intentional with our budgets in general. But that comes back to what we talked about at the start, where planning so that we can be generous allows us to do these things, no matter what the financial climate is like. I looked at Jim for an example of that. When he was receiving an income, generous. When he's receiving his pension, generous, because he is ready. Jim Halliday is a good dude. Um, getting back to your story, though, um, there was just another detail um, from Jesus' teaching that I was really glad that Luke was careful to include. Did you notice how the Samaritan left two silver coins? Um, other translations of the Bible identify those as denarii. So the Samaritan left two days' wages to a stranger, like to a stranger he'd never met. That's not nothing, but it's not what grabbed me. What grabbed me was that he said, if his bill runs higher than this, I'll pay you next time I'm here. Looks to me like this Samaritan travels this road frequently enough to know that he's going to be back this way. 
looks like he gave all the money that he needs for his trip. Like maybe he's heading out and he's going to come back to the inn on the way home. So it looks like he gave all the money that he needed for that trip to a dude before he even got to where he was going. Looks to me that he travels often enough to give his money to some like naked, bleeding dude that he found at the side of the street. Looks to me like he travels this road often enough to know that it's dangerous. Looks to me that as a Samaritan traveling outside of Samaria, he is very aware of that danger and carrying a significant amount of money too. I bet he felt that danger. Looks to me like the Samaritan knows this innkeeper, knows him enough to trust him with this guy who needs urgent care. Looks to me like he was known enough by the innkeeper to be trusted to come back and pay any debts that he might accrue. And it looks to me like he is the kind of dude who, if he had the money on him, he would have paid it there and then, but he didn't, so he didn't. He just did what he could And a mindset trap that, although understandable in our current climate, um, we can end up falling into. It's not what we're aspiring for, but it is what we can fall into. And that's just like, I'd love to, but I can't afford it. Like this Samaritan is held up as the kind of person who loves his neighbors well. And he did what he could with what he had. We've talked about how generosity requires intentionality so that even when we're feeling the squeeze, We do what we can, as much as we can, but just don't do nothing. Just don't do nothing. Like this dude did in an eerily similar event recorded in Luke 18. It says, once a religious leader asked Jesus the question, good teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Heard this before. Why'd you call me good? Jesus asked him, only God is truly good, but to answer your question, You know the commandments. You must not commit adultery. You must not murder. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely. Honor your father and mother. The man replied, I've obeyed all these commands since I was young. When Jesus heard his answer, he said, there is still one thing you haven't done. Sell all your possessions. Give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. And when he heard this, he became very sad, for he was very rich. Almost a repeat performance, right? Do you know, even like again with the inherit verb, I want to get something. Again, the religious leader is cool with obeying all the loving God rules. But again, it's the loving other people part that proves to be the sticking point for him. And this time, Luke does let us in on his reaction. I mean, to be fair. Jesus hits him pretty hard, bro. Like, he comes in strong. Like, I'm over here being like, do what you can. And Jesus over here saying, sell everything you've got. (laughs) I'm going to let him do that. But, and we can see that this dude still fell into a final mindset trap. And that was just like, "I, I just don't want to. I just can't bring myself to do it. I just don't want to. But like uh, like in the first um, events that we read, there's a comparison that's being set up between a like religious elite type and a despised person. In chapter 10, that's the religious leader and the despised Samaritan. Um, In chapter 18, it's this religious, rich, elite leader guy and a despised person um, who comes in the next chapter. And that's Zacchaeus. And I am kind of obsessed with Zacchaeus right now. And I don't trust myself to talk about him and not be here for the next like hour and 45 minutes. So I'm not going to talk about him at all. Instead, let's compare and contrast this rich religious leader from chapter 18 with the despised Samaritan from chapter 10. And I only want to really draw out one clear distinction. One is a dude who already has everything And he wants more. And he's not ready to give up anything. The despised Samaritan, but what makes him so different? Well, here it comes. Here's the key to generosity for me in chapter 33. It says, then a despised Samaritan came along, and when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. Compassion unlocks generosity. 
Nothing is going to unlock generosity in us like compassion. Like for sure, the Samaritan saw a dude in pain and compassion motivated him to move out of his way to do something good for this man, to like give him a boost in whatever way he could. And we want to be like that. We want to be like that. And we want to also be careful that we don't limit our generosity just to when we feel compassion towards someone. Instead, we can leverage that compassion thing and use it in other circumstances. Like what if instead, when we see someone in a moment of celebration and not a moment of pain, if we see them in a moment of celebration and that compassion adjacent thing moves us to go out of our way to do something for them to boost their celebration. I see you in the zone that you're in and I want to be in you in it with you. I could be it and give someone a boost. Like what if we want to be generosity just to give someone a boost, just for the goodness of it. Like, that's good. That's a good thing to do. And it's fun to do. It's fun. Like, I hope you have fun with Generosity Week. For all, like, Monday to Friday next week, we are going to practice intentional generosity, where we're trying to do, we're aiming to do, one generous act per day. And that can be as big or as small as you choose as you're able, as you're ready, as God directs you, whatever that is. But we are shooting to show one act of generosity per day over the next week. And I hope you have so much fun, so much fun doing it. I hope you get to give a dude a boost, like no matter what circumstances they're in. And I hope someone gives you a boost. And I hope that showing generosity intentionally this week just gives you a boost in your spirit, you know? Like it's good to give. It's good to give. And I hope that this concentrated intentionality that you have for this week builds up extra generosity mindset in you, maybe can like dig you out of one of those mindset traps that you've been in and just like set you on a better place to like stepping in and being like, you know what, I am a generous person and I'm going to live in that generosity and that's good. I've got a little challenge for you this week. No prizes for guessing what it is. Um, it's uh, be generous uh, this week. Um, plan some opportunities to be generous. It takes intentionality. If you see something and spontaneously, like the Samaritan did, spontaneously want to show generosity, do it. Do it, do it, do it. But don't wait, just wait for something to come along. Plan your intentional generosity and then you make it happen just make it happen easy things like buy some treats for your staff room or your work break zone or whatever it is like buy and share like that's cute or maybe like you want to tell God I want to I want to bless someone this week and see who he brings to mind like maybe you have be like maybe it's a little gift maybe it's a bigger gift however God moves in you that's good that's cool you probably, I don't know, I'm, I'm not going to speak for you. If you want to do that every day, then I bless you in the name of Jesus. If you don't want to do that every day, I totally get it. And maybe you want to make a financial contribution to someone who lives off rave support, um, or maybe for the nonprofit that they work at, like our dudes, our neighbors, um, who are in that zone, whose names are on the screen, like Ruth Weller, Duncan Wiseman, um, Alex McKechnie, um, who is serving with YWAM. Um, overseas, Chloe Sellers, um, Colin Christine's daughter, um, is with YWAM, who's overseas but currently like back in the zone. And um, Claire or Tony um, with Fields of Life that we heard about a couple of weeks ago. All dudes in that zone that we could support, or, or just buy a dude a coffee. It's only two dollars. Before I'm done um, today, like this sermon and this whole week isn't about generosity directed to the church. Um, this has not been about your giving, and um, this week is not about your giving, but I did say that I had some good news on that front. Um, a couple of weeks ago, Abby uh, sent me our final end of year financial report, and um, our building was uh, very needy this year, and we ended up overspending on it a bunch. Um, we, I'm classic. Um, we also overspent on a bunch of other stuff, like, but, like, you know, things like hospitality, things like feasts. Do you know, we overspent on those, at least according to the budgets that we set around the end of the summer last year. 
because we weren't knowing that all of you were going to be here. <laughs> so it's good for us to have overspent on those. And at Vision Sunday last, uh, just a few months ago, um, we talked about how it's great that our church has been growing so much, but it's time to like think about strengthening up the core. And because so many of you are here, our spending has gone up a bit. But because so many of you are here and so many of you are giving faithfully week in, week out, that core is definitely, definitely strengthening up. I don't know who gives. I'm not privy to that information. But Abby does let me know things like there are three new givers this month and I don't know their names. Uh, she was part of our community for a long time but moved up to Sky um, around this time last year. So names she doesn't know are people who are new to this church within the last year. Um, names that she doesn't know might be people who are new to this church within the last couple of months. If you are someone who has been faithfully, month by month, supporting and investing in God's work and for his kingdom through Rehope Southside for years, I appreciate you. Thank you. If you're someone who is newer up in here, but has got in with that quick obedience and helped strengthen out that core, I appreciate you. And I thank you so much. And Abby also let me know that uh, we can now officially rubber stamp to be considered as fiscally viable as a location, which, which has been a long time coming, but it's here, which is great. Um, when we lived in America, uh, the church that we were working at, uh, when we were moving home, decided that they wanted to support us and they gave us some money. We've made that last, it's run out. And even with that money that we've been using wisely and stewarding wisely, even with that running out, like Rehope Southside is now able to support the ministry of Rehope Southside and we are able to move forward, grow stronger, dream bigger, run faster, do things. Um, we're breaking even. <laughs> we're breaking even is great. Um, we're not flush by any stretch of the imagination, but this is a really big first step. I thank you. I appreciate you um, for your giving and also for trusting us to steward your generous and joyful giving to the Lord. You're good dudes. I appreciate you so much.